So we are going to continue our study on the book of 1 Corinthians. We have been studying this epistle. We are now in chapter 7. I invite you to open up your Bibles there, if you will, and uh, join me as I read the different passages from this chapter. And as you see here, we're going to be talking about uh, the gift of singleness, marriage, and divorce. We will talk about remarriage as well. And uh, I understand that, that this topic can be very sensitive as well. Last week, we talked about uh, sexual purity and also church discipline. So Paul is still addressing the issue of sexual immorality and sexual purity. Uh, however, I must preach the word of God. Would you say amen for that? You know, during our evangelistic series, uh, I was telling the people, if it is in the Bible, it's for me. But if it's not in the Bible, it's not for me, right? And I think we should uh, have the same premise here during our divine service, right? So let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to bless the reading of the word. And then we're going to see what this chapter has to say for us. Father in heaven, I would like to... Pray for a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit now. We also pray for the presence of your holy angels to fill the empty places of this church. And we ask for a moment where we can only feel the influence from heaven. We ask you, Lord, to enlighten our minds, speak to our hearts, bring conviction, instruct us through your word. And I pray for myself that you help me to deliver the message according to your will. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So in this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talks about uh, five groups of people. He talks about those who are single. He talks about people in a relationship but not married yet. He talks about married uh, people, divorced people, and widow or widower. And I think it includes pretty much everyone. So I don't want you to feel that, oh, perhaps the pastor made that sermon for me because really it's for everyone. All of us, we feel in one of these categories or these groups. Um, I want to start by showing that Paul is responding to a misunderstanding of the Corinthians. So because sin was a huge problem in the pagan community, in the Gentile community, and several of the converts in Corinth came from paganism, they were Gentiles, not all of them, but several of them. So they come from that background. They bring baggages into their faith and their journey with Christ. Some of them, they were falling back in their old past, as we saw in chapter 5 and chapter 6. And Paul needs to instruct them to flee fornication and adultery. But some in the church of Corinth, as a remedy for the problem of sin, they are advocating abstinence from sex altogether. And Paul is going to respond to that approach, and we will see that Paul does not endorse that. But we see that indication right here in chapter 1, uh, excuse me, chapter 7 and verse 1. If you have your Bibles there, you're welcome to go there with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we are going to read uh, verse 1. The Bible says here in verse 1, Now concerning the things of which you wrote me. So notice, they wrote to Paul about what Paul is going to address here in the first verses. They wanted to know. And then Paul says, Concerning the things that they wrote to him, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. We will see in this chapter that Paul agrees partially with their thinking that it is okay. He's not talking about morally speaking, but he says it is okay for a man not to touch a woman, meaning to 
not have sexual relationship and to remain single. But he shows that that's not the solution for sexual immorality. He has a broader view of uh, the privileges of the sexual life. And I want you to see from verse 2 to verse 3 what he says there. The first word there is nevertheless. So he's going to add to their thinking here. Because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own what if you want? Wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her. And he is talking here in the context of sexual relationship. And likewise also the wife to her husband. So Paul understood very well the nature of man. That we are sexual beings. And he understands the impulses of our nature. And he says, that's not what we find actually in scriptures. That's not God's will, that someone must abstain from sex, and that is a prescription for everybody else. But he speaks about sex in the context of marriage, because he says, again, in verse uh, 2, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorali immorality, let each man have his own what, everyone? Wife. And the same with the women, let, their, let them have their own husbands. So notice in verse 5, in verse 5, Paul advocates for sex in the marriage relationship. He says, do not deprive one another except with, what's the next word there? Consent for a time. In other words, there is no permanent consent here to deprive the other from the sexual relationship. For a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again, meaning, again, be active in their sexual relationship so that Satan does not, what's the next word, tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So he understands that if one partner deprives the other for a long period of time, he or she may cause the other to be tempted. And he's saying, don't do that. Now, notice in Hebrews, you don't need to go there. Just I want you to see that Paul is very consistent in his approach to active sexual life only in the marriage relationship notice in hebrews 13 verse 4 marriage is honorable among all and then he connects marriage with what and the bed undefiled so he connects marriage with the bed relationship but fornicators which is sex without the marriage relationship and adulterers which is also sex Without the marriage relationship, God will judge. So when we approach to this chapter, we need to consider this chapter in the context of marriage, especially when talking about active sexual life. Notice in verse 6 to verse 9, Paul recognized also the gift of singleness. There is a gift that God gives to certain people to be by themselves. And let me just say this, that the gift of singleness, all of us has or have had in one point of our lives. And we must be able to enjoy that time of our lives. And Paul connects that time, the gift of singleness, with the opportunity to serve the Lord more fully. So notice what we find in verses 6 through 9 here. The Bible says, but I say this as a concession. Not as a command when he says that uh, people can marry and be active in their sexual life. He says this is a concession, it's a privilege that is given uh, because sex is a gift from God, far from being the original sin of Adam and Eve. God never mentioned that in his word, but he gave for reproduction and also for recreation within the marriage relationship. 
But I say this as a concession, not as a command. It's not a command for everyone to marry and be active. For I wish that all men were even as myself. So Paul presents himself as being unmarried. Most likely, Paul had been married in one point of his life because he was part of the Sanhedrin. And uh, to be part of that, you needed to be married. We don't know what happened with his wife. If she passed, we don't have that information. But Paul says, For I wish that all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God. Notice the word gift. One in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise, what is the next word? Self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion, meaning to commit fornication or adultery. So, Again, Paul recognized that there is a gift of being by yourself. And we need to identify if that's God's calling to our lives or not. Now, notice again in verse 1 where we began. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good. It is okay for a man to not touch a woman. And what are the reasons that he gives for people to appropriate the gift of singleness if for a moment of someone's life or for his or her entire life what would be some of the reasons why does Paul write what he writes in this chapter I want to invite you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 25 through 27 so this is uh, you know a troubling passage for some people and we need to understand contextually Let's begin in verse 25, just a portion it says there. Now concerning virgins, I have uh, no commandment from the Lord. When he says I have no commandment from the Lord, it means that he's not quoting the Lord Jesus because he did quote to the Lord Jesus in this chapter. Now notice in verse 26 what he says under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, meaning to not marry. I want you to notice the word or the words present distress. Do you see that there? We need to talk about that. What is the present distress that made Paul write that it is preferable for people not to marry? Sometimes people think that Paul is writing this for everyone. It is better for someone not to marry, but it's not the case. He's talking about a circumstance that was happening in his days. The present distress, whatever that is. You will talk about that. And then he says that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loose or to divorce. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. What is the present distress that Paul is talking about saying to the single? Just remain as you are. He is primarily talking about the instability in the Roman Empire against Christianity. Persecution that made it unstable to make up a family. He's talking about the near destruction of Jerusalem that the Lord Jesus had prophesied. Now, in verse... 28, he makes very clear that this is not a prescription for everyone, even during the time of the present distress. He writes in verse 28, but even if you, do, uh, if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. Trouble in the flesh, in the in the context of the present distress to have a family. Now, let's continue here to unpack this chapter. We will see that uh, for Paul, one of the reasons also, another reason I should say for unmarried people not to be so concerned about marrying and, the, and about the gift of singleness is in verse 32. Go there with me to chapter 7. Chapter 7. 
and verse 32, notice what he says about those who has the gift of singleness, whether momentarily in your life or for your whole life, he says in verse 32, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of who, everyone? Of the Lord. So for Paul, it was very serious. Christianity was very serious. And he said to the young people or those that are unmarried, if you are unmarried, you are without the extra care of the married life, and you can serve the Lord more freely. How he may please the Lord. Notice in verse 35, just skip a few verses and go to verse 35. It says, and this is safe for your own profit. Not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may do what, everyone? Serve the Lord without distraction. So for those that are married, you know uh, what Paul is talking about. Once you have a family, you don't have the same flexibility as a single person has to serve the Lord. You have other cares, and once you have children, that load increases even more. And that may hinder people to serve the Lord as freely as the single person can. Now, let's talk about something a little more sensitive. What does the Bible teach about marriage, divorce, and remarry? Or remarriage. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Let's go back to verse 10. I want you to see what Paul wrote here. Excuse me. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but who is commanding here? The Lord, because he's going to quote the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he's saying this, the Lord, and not I. He's not undermining his apostolic authority his prophetic authority he's just saying now i'm specifically quoting the lord jesus referring to what he said when he was on earth a wife is not to depart from her husband we will unpack that more in case someone is nervous what's coming here but we will cover uh, what paul says in this chapter as a whole but let's see what the lord has said in his ministry since paul is referring back to the lord notice in matthew chapter 5 verses 31 and 32 furthermore it has been said this is jesus speaking whoever divorces his wife let him give her a certificate of divorce but I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except for what reason? Sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery with her. If her divorce was for any other reason except sexual immorality. Let's see another passage that the Lord Jesus um, spoke in the New Testament, Mark chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband, it's pretty much the same, and marries another, she commits adultery. The Christian standard for marriage is very high. And sometimes, um, unfortunately, in some cases, Christianity is lowering the standards. I want to read a, a statement here from uh, the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, 708, concerning what was happening in those days. The command of Jesus leaves no room for the many excuses for legal separation that are accepted by the civil courts of today such as incompatibility, mental cruelty, and others of more trivial nature. The Greek and Roman laws allow separation in the context of the word separation here is talking about divorce. I do make a distinction of divorce and separation. We will talk about that in a little bit. But the Greek and Roman laws allow separation of husband and wife for trifling reasons. The same was true also among who? the Jews and that's why 
uh, these questions came not only to Jesus, but also to the church in Corinth, especially in the context of assimilating believers from the Gentile world. But simply put, the difference between divorce and separation, uh, divorce you are legally separating, but separation can be necessary in cases of abuse with the purpose to bring redemption and repentance. So God's plan A is for divorce not to happen, but reconciliation is God's plan B if a separation happens because of problems in the marriage. Notice in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 11, the very next verse that we were reading, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried to be, what's the next word? Reconciled to her husband, and the husband is not to divorce his wife. Now, I want to read here a statement from Louis Smeads. Notice what he wrote about marriage. And, uh, and, uh, and I believe that Paul understands the challenges of marriage. And I want to bring this quote to add uh, to the sensitivity that Paul is having with his audience. We do not give ourselves a good chance for growing personally if we keep Hankering after our fantasy of the ideal what? Woman or, or man. So in other words, when uh, a couple or a person is experiencing problem in the marriage, he or she can easily feel tempted in our days, and I believe uh, the same in the days of the church in Corinth, to believe that he or she made a mistake. And they have this fantasy that marriage is supposed to be smooth and very romantic in all of its stage and, and moments. Notice what it says. We grow when we keep renewing our commitment to the only spouse we've got. Did you see the emphasis here in the author? We are going to, uh, the reference is right there. But you see here that he's emphasizing the concept of experiencing growth. Experiencing what, everyone? Growth. Why is it relevant in the context of marriage? Because sometimes we marry thinking that the purpose of marriage is to be happy. And then we have this expectation that if I'm not happy, therefore, you know, probably I made the wrong choice. But really, the primary purpose of marriage is to reproduce the image of God, is character development. You see right in the beginning, even before sin, when God created man in his own image, he created them male and female, and the two came together, talking about Adam and Eve, and they became one flesh, and that's what it means to reproduce the image of God, the character of God. The primary purpose of marriage is character development. And God uh, places us with people when we enter the marriage vow through prayer so we can grow. We grow when we stop dreaming of a perfect marriage and adjust currently to the one we have. Would you say amen for that? Notice what it says here. Our best growth comes when we forget about our own growth and focus on caring instead. Here's a nice twist. Instead of giving us a good reason for giving up a lifetime commitment, our need to grow is a primary reason for keeping it. So Paul is going to expand the, uh, the concept of divorce and remarriage um, and when I see expand from where Jesus left off this topic, and he's going to add more information through his prophetic authority. Notice what we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 15. This is sometimes bypassed, um, but I want you to see that uh, there is a second reason for Divorce and remarriage. Notice what he says here, verse 15. But if the unbeliever is talking about a spouse that does not believe in the Lord Jesus, um, if the unbeliever departs 
in the context of divorce in this chapter, let him do what? Depart. So before we read the rest, who is initiating the divorce here? The unbeliever. It's not the believing spouse. But if the unbeliever departs, because Paul believed that when somebody converts to Christianity and the spouse doesn't, the person needed to remain married and should not initiate a divorce. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under what, everyone? Bondage in such a cases. But God has called us to peace, meaning that we do not initiate. We are here to make the relationship work. But he does say that if the unbelieving spouse initiates, God does not uh, hold uh, the believing spouse to the same standard as two believing spouses together. I want to read a statement here from the Biblical Research Institute in an article called Jesus and Divorce and Remarriage in Matthew 19. He writes, the two exceptions for divorce, porneia, which is the word for adultery there, it involves all kinds of sexual sins. The two exceptions for divorce, porneia and divorce by unbelieving spouse, as discussed in 1 Corinthians 7, are different. Only in the first case, the adultery, the sexual sin problem, first case, can the spouse who was not involved in adultery request a divorce. So in the first case, the one who remained faithful can initiate the divorce. In the other case, the believing partner is passive and does not take the initiative to get a divorce. And it goes on to say, in the two exceptional cases just mentioned, not only is divorce possible, as tragic as that is, but also the faithful partner uh, or the believing partner who is divorced by the unbeliever may what, everyone? May remarry, according to the scriptures. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I want you to see that he addresses even those who are in a committed relationship but not married yet. What kind of relationship did I say? Committed. Let's go there to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 36 and 37. Notice what it says here. But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, and we're going to see that behaving improperly here includes um, he is, um, you know, feeling tempted or delaying the marriage vow if she is past the flower of youth in other words the engagement or the committed relationship took so long that she's no longer young enough to find somebody else so she passed the flower of youth and thus it must be let him do what he wishes in the sense that he can decide there if he's going to marry her or not marry her that's what it means but does what uh, do what he wishes he does not sin if he decides not to marry or if he decides to marry her. But what is the counsel? Let them do what? Let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, meaning that he can have self-control over his sexual impulses, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will do what with his virgin? Are you there? He will keep his virgin thus well. So let's understand what he's saying here because he's not saying, okay, so if you can have self-control, you do not need to marry this person, but you are free to find somebody else. That's not what he says. He says because of the long relationship with that person to the point that that person can now very heartily find somebody else to marry, you have moral obligations to that person. 
You may not marry her, that's fine. I counsel you to marry her. If you can control yourself and not commit fornication, that's fine. But you must keep your virgin. You just don't, okay, I'm not married. I never sealed the commitment. I've been with you for 10 years. Now, rarely you're going to find someone to marry. I'm free in the sight of heaven to just let you go. That's not what Paul says. So what about what he says to widows or widowers? So we saw a little bit of that, but let's just... Uh, cover some more he talks about that again in verse 39 go there with me to verse 39 he does mention that it is okay for someone that have lost his or her spouse to remarry notice in verse 39 a wife is bound by law as long as her husband what lives so that implies that if he dies now she's no longer bound to the law of marriage but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only, what's the next word? In the Lord. That's the biblical standard for marriage. For someone that knows the Lord Jesus and the word of God, if he or she will remarry because has become a widow or a widower, it has to be in the Lord, meaning that someone of the same faith. Notice Romans um, 7 verse 2 that's in the book of Romans Paul says a similar thing he says for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives but if the husband dies she is released from the law of her husband so very clear nevertheless he again goes back into the present distress that makes preferable not to enter into a hasty marriage relationship. Actually, in any case, a hasty marriage relationship is not recommendable. Uh, but definitely here in this context, he writes, but she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the Spirit of God. We read in verse 8 and 9, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul is really concerned in guarding the believers against sexual immorality. Conclusions here of our study this morning. Number one, singleness is a what, everyone? It's a gift and can be... A blessing in various cases so never you know like talk to someone that is single you need to marry or try to to match that person you know so it may be God's will for that person to be single if not for the whole life at least in that period of his or her life let them enjoy in serving God marriage should be between two individuals of the same faith in the Lord that's what we read. Uh, sexual intimacy is a blessing in the context of married couples. Number four, divorce was not part of God's original purpose for marriage. Number five, divorce and marriage is biblically accepted. Um, remarriage, excuse me. Divorce and remarriage is biblically accepted in cases of, what's the next word? Adultery. Divorce and remarriage is biblically accepted when an unbelieving spouse abandons the believing spouse. So it's not initiated by the believing, but initiated by the unbelieving spouse. Seven, a man is in a long-term relationship with a woman, has moral obligations toward her. And number eight, biblically... Uh, Widows and widowers can remarry, though Paul counsels caution. I want to read this statement from Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 221. God has placed man in the world, and it is the privilege to eat, to drink, to trade, to marry, to be given in marriage, but it is safe to do these things only in the what, everyone? 
in the fear of God, with a lot of prayer, with a lot of counseling. We should live in the world with reference to the eternal world in mind. So that's why Paul says, and that should be for all of us, but as God has distributed, God distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Whatever gift the Lord has given you. And I'll close with this self-reflection. Number one, has God, for the unmarried now, has God given me the gift of singleness which I can exercise for the good of his kingdom? If so, make sure you do use of your gift in the proper way. Does my proposed marriage partner share my dedication to Jesus Christ? Will my marriage detract from or enhance my preparation for Christ's return? Now to the married, here's our self-reflection. Am I practicing the degree of mutual respect that seems to, so important to Paul? Am I deeply committed to my marriage? Do I allow Christ to help me retain loyalty to my mate even though he or she falls short of my ideal? How can my spouse and I join in more unhindered devotion to the Lord? So may the Lord give us grace and wisdom in every situation.